so when I set out to write this book, it wasn't because I had all these thoughts that I really wanted to get out to people about political panic. I just, I just wondered what the hell's going on. You know, it just, I'd, I'd hear all this rage. You can guess the sources and the news media I was hearing it on. And, uh, and, and it, it just struck me, not a terribly original thought either, that there are uh, uh, recurring elements to this. Some of you, if you know Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, set during the Salem witch hunts, uh, what was produced during the 1950s, obviously showing the connection between the Red Scare of the 50s and the Salem witch trial. But I, I really wanted to see how extensive are those recurring elements. Uh, and, and the question that, that I really was hoping to get to is why the political panics happen. So what I want to do here tonight is kind of just sort of walk you through my own learning curve as I researched what then became this, this book. It would be vastly simplified because as I have been told, I am not a very linear learner. Uh, but uh, I began with that question, are there, are there recurring elements? And uh, what I'm about to show actually is one of the first places I looked was for just uh, uh, strong visual elements that are there recurring elements. And as you can see, no problem, uh, there are recurring elements over time and political panics. Uh, I was told uh, I should have included my one that I have for tomorrow's talk, which shows two Microsoft octopuses, but uh, I didn't know if it would be appropriate here. So. Uh, but, but, but the, so yes, there are recurring elements, but then, so what are they? And, and where I began to look and ended up thinking, oh, that's uh, discovering that's not the whole story, are times of national hardship, the Great Depression. Yeah, there were political panics that spun out of that kind of terrain. Uh, I wondered about politicians who, uh, or news media uh, that might uh, uh, stir up panic where really no panic had existed before. And yes, there have been panics like that. And I don't just mean Fox News or something like that today. We'll be talking later about a, a panic over, of all things, the Freemasons, the guys who wear the fezes and the sequins and all. Uh, a little known panic that was completely stirred up from, in that case, also the, the news media. Uh, I wondered about grassroots panic. Does sometimes it happen, happen uh, at a grassroots level with economic conflicts maybe of some sort and bubble up from there, and yes, there have been uh, panics like that. This region, in fact, had one of the biggest. By this region, I mean the West Coast, uh, uh, about the Chinese during uh, uh, the mid-19th century. And what I didn't think would be a category, I bumped into it in the course of research, but it's actually been the cause of a whole lot of panics, and that is times of national success. I'll get more specific of, about that a little further on, but where we have achieved something, and the panic emanates from the fear of losing uh, what, what we've achieved. Whole other set of questions, this was all sort of my outset where I'm beginning and trying to sort through this, was is, 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 is political alarm necessarily panic? And clearly it is not. There were genuine reasons to be alarmed about terrorism in this country, uh, as we saw on 9-11. On that is not necessarily panic. But this was panic. This was uh, the Ursuline Convent in Somerville, Massachusetts, which was burned to the ground uh, uh, by a mob in 1834. And so where I want to begin is how did we get there and how did this mob come to be so enraged at these nuns that they burned down their convent in 1834? And it, the, how we got there begins in this case with in fact a national success. And the national success was we won the revolution and we created a nation in which a founding principle was freedom of religion. And that created a fear among many that, you know, if a lot of Catholics come into this country, potentially the Pope could be running the United States. In that fear is a, an element I call an absolute. Uh, that recurs a lot in political panics, the use of an absolute, kind of a no-brainer that this will be the death of democracy as an absolute and lines like that. But more often the absolute is something like I'm just describing with Catholics. And the absolute is the, the implication that all Catholics think and act alike. Uh, five of the first 13 states after the revolution prohibited anyone other than a Protestant from holding elective office. Most of them dropped that pretty quickly. Some held on a little longer. But it was already so much of a fear that it was like, well, they can't, they can't hold political office. There were other things, the Alien and Sedition Act, things like this, 
it kept building. And in fact, it started building when, in fact, Catholics did start coming into this country in some numbers. And I'm talking before the potato famine in the mid-19th century, quite a few French people came here who were Catholic because of the upheavals in France with their revolution. Quite a few Irish Catholics came prior again to the potato famine because of political upheavals in Ireland pertaining mainly with conflicts with, with England. So we come to 1834, and I want to sh show you some of the phrasing from a sermon that was given by a minister named Lyman Beecher. He was a prominent uh, Boston minister. He's the father, he was the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, he was the father of uh, a prominent abolitionist named Henry Ward Beecher. He's a classy guy. This isn't just some, you know, you know, fanatic fellow, if you will. And you can see, I've underlined key words. Up at the top, he's kind of setting his point that the Catholic system is adverse to liberty, and his point being because of the answering to the Pope and so forth. And I'm, I'm highlighting in these different recurring elements of panic. So that you'll see he's, he says that they are induced to act as one, basically what I just said that all Catholics, he's saying, will think and act alike. There's another uh, uh, recurring element, and we'll see more of these in the course of this talk, that I call a blank to be filled in. That is some statement uh, uh, where you, the listener, or the reader, will fill in what it means, and in doing so, you can't help but have your fears and your needs participate in the way you fill it in. So it draws you in in a very individual way. In this case, it's where he says, how many presses might they influence by their promised patronage or threatened withdrawment? Uh, how many mechanics, merchants, lawyers, physicians, in any political crisis might they reach and render timid? I don't know, how many? He's not telling us. You'll, you'll fill that in based on your fear and needs of how influential Catholics can be. Uh, when I talked about national success, here it is right in his, his sermon. He says, it is the light of our pro Republican prosperity which is sending earthquake, I think he means earthquakes, under the foundations of their thrones, and they have, here comes an absolute, no hope of rest and primeval darkness, but by the, here's an absolute, extinction of our light. But here's where it really gets interesting, why I picked this particular sermon. He's now pivoting toward his climax, and he says, but if this nation is in the providence of God, destined to lead the way in the moral and political emancipation of the world, let me stop right there. This is the one piece that I found of political panic that is uniquely American. I mean, political pa panics happen everywhere. But the piece that's uniquely American, this mission that he's referring to, uh, uh, there is a scholar named Sak von Berkovich, oddly enough, he's a Canadian, uh, who wrote a book called The Puritan Origins of the American Self. In it, he says that when the Puritans founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they had a mission. It was articulated by John Winthrop in a sermon coming across to this land where he said that they would establish in this new country uh, a new Jerusalem, a, a city on a hill. City on a hill is a phrase that John Kennedy used in his inaugural address, and Ronald Reagan used it in his farewell address. Very, very uh, much alive kind of imagery. And his idea was, and the Puritan mission was, that we would establish this, 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 this new Jerusalem that would be a beacon to the world of a pure Christianity, and through that, it would bring the world to the one true way. Berkovich's point is that by the time of the revolution, the colonists had secularized that mission and had shaped, replaced Christianity with liberty and democracy, so that now we would be a beacon to the world of liberty and democracy, and through that beacon, bring the world to the one true way. When I read that in Berkovich a couple years ago, I remember my first thought was, wow, that's a really interesting point. And then this little voice in the back of my head said, but it is the one true way. Our way, you know, democracy and freedom, that, that, that is the one true way. It, it, even as I read the book, I couldn't shake myself, I still can't, of my belief in it. And I'm telling, sharing this with you to show how deeply inscribed this concept is in a lot of us, if not nearly all of us, and that Beecher uses it, and then watch what he does. He's gonna pivot into a blank to be filled in that is gonna really get a lot of octane out of that, uh, 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 that American perception, where he says that you know, if, if this is our mission in the world, he says uh, it is time she understood her high calling and were harnessed for the work, 
The work is a blank to be filled in. What is the work? Within two days, it might have been the next day, I can't quite remember, but certainly no more than two, after he gave that sermon in Boston, a mob burned down the Ursuline Convent across the Charles River in, in Somerville. Uh, uh, so the, 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 these things can be extremely potent and can operate, I think, in levels that people aren't always uh, aware of. Uh, I want to talk a little about Anna Ella Carroll, also still in, the, in terms of the panic over Catholics, which was a really long and, and bloody uh, panic and, and, and involved a lot of, of death. But the piece that I want to talk about here is, is whether, I don't know if Lyman Beecher was really panicked or not. My guess would be he really was. But sometimes I get the feeling people are using panic availing themselves of it. And I'm not so sure if they're themselves really panicked. But you can't climb in someone's head, so it's hard to know. I think with Anna Ella Carroll, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that she is a good example of someone who is availing herself of panic. Uh, she wrote a book in 1854, uh, which is about uh, uh, the same thing as Lyman Beecher, the fear that Catholics might control the country. She's specifically talking about the land, another national success, that we got in the Louisiana Purchase. And who will be mo who's moving out there? And will we lose this land, she's arguing, to the Catholics? One of the things that scared her in particular was they had no public schools yet out there, anywhere really yet in this country. Uh, uh, and, and among others, the Jesuits were very active in bringing schools to these uh, areas in, 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 in the Midwest. Anyone could go to a Jesuit school. Uh, uh, and she thought, oh, this is all part of a, 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 a plot by the Pope and so forth. Uh, the piece I want to hearken to in her book that, 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 that makes me think this is a brilliant use of panic is in her introduction. Uh, I'll read a few of these phrases. As a woman, I shrink with timidity. Uh, 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 and she refers to that refined delicacy to which she, woman, is assigned by nature. I have no aspirations to extend her influence or position. Maybe she's just being coy, you know, I don't know. But whether she's being coy or not, she has just described the role of women in mid-19th century America. And if you had to sum it up in one word, it would be unempowered. But when you have panic, you have a lot of passion. There's a lot of panic, uh, p power out there. And if you can tap it, if you have the ability in, to tap it in just the right way, you can acquire some of that power. Anna L. Carroll wrote uh, this book, even though she shrinks with timidity and has no aspirations. In fact, she wrote two books uh, the same year, published two books, basically on uh, both having to do with, with uh, Catholics. Uh, uh, and, and, and just basically it's Lyman Beecher kind of arguments. One line that I pulled up here is, they, meaning the founders of the country, were men of one faith and one oath, uh, not men who held the ballot box for America and the oath of fidelity to the Pope. So she's got all kinds of absolutes going on opposite sides of the equation. So there are a number of things particularly interesting to me about Anna L. Carroll. First, she was, I believe it was the great niece or grand niece, I don't know if I have the family tree quite right, of a man named Charles Carroll. Charles Carroll was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and Charles Carroll was a Catholic. Anna L. Carroll's father was a Catholic. Her mother was a Protestant. They got married in a Catholic ceremony, but they agreed their children would be raised as Protestants. These were not families that were at war with each other over their religions. I, don't, I wasn't in the house, so I don't know what went on that the daughter, Anna Ella, grew up with such vehemence about Catholics, if in fact she had such uh, vehemence about Catholics. But it's just sort of curious, and for the moment I'll leave it there. Five years after she published these books, the Civil War broke out, and, Anna Ella, and, and Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, which was a very controversial thing to do. And she published an article defending Lincoln suspending habeas corpus. But it wasn't a moral argument that she made. She made a legal argument. She rooted her arguments in law and in precedents from the courts. She's not even a lawyer, but she was, she was a brilliant woman. And it was such a brilliant article that it came to the attention of Lincoln. Her next writing assignment was for Lincoln. And what she wrote was an alternate strategy. Are you ready for this? She wrote an alternate strategy for invading the South along the Valley, Tennessee River Valley, the Western theater of the Civil War. 
compared to the one that the generals were initiating. That document is still studied by military historians uh, and, and, and other historians. It's still out there. It was, it was so brilliant. After the Civil War, you see Anna Ella Carroll's name on the boards of director and other kind of uh, highly, uh, high ranking positions in the feminist movement. Is she not aspiring to something here with that first book? I don't know, but what I do know is this unempowered, and she was an unempowered woman in 1854, found through this panic a platform up to a very impressive uh, um, career. Uh, in this statement, one other thing I want to key to in this statement is it's sort of indirect, but she says they were, she's talking about the founders, and she says they were men of one faith and one oath. And this is kind of implying a, a, a group of people, which is what I believe is probably the most frequently used absolute in political panic across the political spectrum. And that is these guys, the founding fathers. The absolute that's implicit in references to the founding fathers believe that the vision of the founding fathers was the intent of the founding fathers as if all these guys agreed with each other and shared a vision. They did agree that the United States should not be part of England. After that, I'm hard pressed to tell you anything these guys agreed upon. Uh, uh, but you see it across the spectrum. And I want to just give two examples uh, from either end of that spectrum. Uh, 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 f and both of them are from some time ago, but there's no difficulty finding modern ones. This is a book from 1906. Uh, uh, it was it, he, his fear of, of socialism. Socialism, communism, anarchism, all these radical isms that were bubbling up uh, uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century is what, what he's writing about. And he says, our constitution was framed, so that's sort of this reference to the framers, with the credible object object of allowing, and here's an absolute, absolute freedom. He even uses the word absolute in business conduct. So he has used an, uh, an absolute. He's also used something that no surprise will find in political panic, outright falsehoods or mistakes. The Constitution only talks about business conduct once. Article 1, Section 8, Congress shall have the authority to re re regulate interstate commerce, which is quite the opposite of saying absolute freedom in, in business conduct. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. This is an 1895 book uh, by a congressman, uh, M.W. Howard, uh, and it's Fear of Plutocracy. Today we might call it Wall Street or billionaires, but you, the, the fear is very much alive still today. He says, uh, uh, his founding father uses, he says, the millionaire is a product of modern civilization. He was, here it is, wholly unknown to our revolutionary forefathers, here's the other, he could not have flourished in the same atmosphere which gave birth to the Declaration of Independence. Actually, it is true. There were no millionaires at the time of the revolution. No one had a million dollars, no one, because our currency wasn't in dollars. It was in shillings and pounds and things like that. We did have rich people, very, very rich people. Some of them were founding fathers. Uh, one who was not a founding father was a man named Haim Solomon who was an incredibly wealthy merchant uh, trader in uh, Philadelphia who lent huge sums of money to the Continental Congress to prosecute the war. But there were, it's a completely uh, mythic to say that there were no rich people uh, back then. Uh, I, I, I mentioned uh, uh, the panic over Freemasons and it's, it's I hardly remember it anymore, but it was a huge panic that began in the 1820s. It actually generated its own political party called the Anti-Masonic Party. Uh, uh, and it was a panic that, as far as I can tell, was totally manipulated, not so much by politicians, but by as people aspiring to political roles uh, uh, from positions such as newspaper editors and things like that. Uh, the man I want to talk about here is, uh, 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 oh, I see, let me just explain what this picture is. Here's what spawned it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to read it. It, it, it. It's an event, we, I don't think we need to go into the details, but a Masonic lodge in western New York, in the book I talk more about how this came to be at this lodge, got into a conflict with a guy. I'll just put it that way for now. And a group of people in that lodge abducted him. That's known. And after that, we don't really know 
except he was never seen again. So you can't charge him with murder because you've really gotten a stuff, you know. But it makes a great mystery. It makes a great news story. And uh, Thurlow Weed, who was an editor of a newspaper in Rochester, published this story, as did other papers picking it up. It was, you know, it was a fascinating news story. But boy, did he hop on top of it, along with a few others. A man named Solomon Southwick was also very active in it. Southwick ended up running for governor of New York. He had his own agenda where he was heading with it. Weed and these others formed a, a, a citizens group that they called the Lewiston Convention that was gonna get to the bottom of this thing because the court system was pretty much stymied. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this little news item uh, I found fascinating because it said Mr. Weed, editor of the Rochester Telegraph, who was appointed one of the delegates to the Lewiston Convention. Just fascinating to me. You, you created the Lewiston Convention. Who, who appointed you? But okay. Uh, did not go in consequence of having been threatened by the Masons. There are two blanks to be filled in there. The first is, who threatened him? Was it, we don't know. Was it, was it some crazy Mason who sent him a note or is it just some copycat guy or, or is there a conspiracy? Who, and who are these Masons? Because a lot of times they keep their membership secret. So there's lots of blanks to be filled in as to who's issuing this threat, assuming it to be true. Uh, that we will fill in with fears and needs as, 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 as much as we have them. The other blank to be filled in that he did by not showing up to the convention was his very absence at that convention because it continually called attention to him by virtue of his absence. And I would imagine in the minds of the delegates was like, well, what would Mr. Weed say? What would Mr. Weed do? Well, he's not there to disappoint you with what he would say or do. So you will fill it in kind of in the other direction and invest Mr. Weed with you know, uh, all kinds of uh, presumably you know, wise stuff. Just, let's just jump to the end of Thurlow Weed's career. And they did build this national party, the anti-Masonic party. Well, he took it as, into the national scene, then realized that that's as far as it's gonna play, and he jumped over to the Whig party, then to the Republican party. He became one of the leading power brokers. He was behind the uh, screen kind of guy. Uh, one of the leading power brokers in this nation. His main, if you will, client uh, was William Seward, who was a shoe in for the presidency in 1860, except that Weed miscalculated a one-term congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. This political cartoon from 1864 shows uh, uh, politicians and the political power brokers of the time measuring Lincoln's boots as Lincoln is sleeping, and what it's trying to show is uh, that they're trying to figure out if there's a way to unseat this guy when he runs for re-election. The man that is circled in the foreground is William Seward, who was Lincoln's Secretary of State, and in the back, the man circled is, is, is Thurlow Weed. He built a career out of, you know, creating this, this panic over Freemasons. This isn't just stuff that happened in the past. Here's a recent example of an attempt to do the same thing. This is, I think it's from 2011, uh, Newt Gingrich. I'm just, at this point, just kind of going to phrases because I think you can pretty much intuit what, what uh, the, the context of them is. He says that Sharia is a mortal threat to the survival of freedom. So there's an absolute, it's a mortal threat to the survival of freedom. Then he goes on in a statement to use uh, a blank to be filled in, again in this form of secrecy, where he says stealth jihadists use political, cultural, societal, religious, and intellectual tools. Like, who are these stealth jihadists? What Muslims that are in our political, cultural, societal, religious, or intellectual tools are actually stealth jihadists, you know? Is that cab driver that I had? Is, is he a stealth jihadist? Uh, uh, and then he, he uses a, 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 an element that actually, in the book, I have a lot of examples of. This is not the best of them, but since it's right in his speech, I thought I'll just use this one for now, which is where sometimes people will try to tap into other panics to add octane to what they're trying to fuel fear of. Uh, Newt Gingrich said, the left's refusal to tell the truth about the Islamist threat is a natural parallel to the 70-year pattern of left-wing intellectuals refusing to tell the truth about communism and the Soviet Union. I don't know how much octane he got out of the Fred Scare in 2011, but, it, but the effort is the same. Others were much more potent, uh, but since it was just sitting there waiting to be plucked, I, I used uh, that one as the example. 
Let's go the other direction to panics that emanate from the bottom up. And the panic that really exemplifies this, as I mentioned before, was uh, panic over uh, uh, the Chinese. Um, uh, and the, 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 I didn't realize uh, in, 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 until I did the research, actually with a lot of these panics, particularly with the Catholics and the Chinese, how much murder took place uh, in uh, uh, Tacoma, Washington, Tacoma, we're in Washington, in Tacoma. Uh, the the uh, uh, absolute ethnic cleansing of the Chinese, I um, can't remember, the, uh, 1887, I think, uh, where they just declared you have to be out uh, this date, and if you're not, We'll round you up and take you out, and they did. Uh, 85, thank you. And it would have been 86 that there were three days of riots in this city, in Seattle, uh, toward the Chinese. But, you know, Washington State was no different than the rest of the West Coast. And this really began down in California with the gold rush. Because when there was the gold rush, it wasn't just Americans rushing out there in 1849. People from all over the world were coming from Central America, South America, some Europeans, and a lot of Chinese. So at the outset, you had these little mining camps of miners, and some of them would be Chinese miners. This is an illustration of an American mining camp and a Chinese mining camp from some magazine from the time that I, I pulled out. And there would be intense competition, particularly if it looked like somebody was, was striking stuff and you weren't. Uh, and, and very, very often, there would be violence, as far as I know, always perpetrated by the Americans against, not necessarily the Chinese only, they did it once against a Chilean camp. Uh, and, and oftentimes it would be accompanied by the kind of thing in this news article, which is a resolution they would pass to kind of justify what they're about to do. I'm not gonna read the resolution, but if you, if, I hope you can see well enough, the words that are squared off in blue are all one absolute after another, after another, after another. And here in black, I've put in uh, a, a sort of founding father thing where they used to make reference to, and they put it in quotes, the inalienable uh, rights of Americans, hearkening to the Declaration of, of Independence. Uh, 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 eventually, this spread from mining areas to uh, San Francisco, uh, because at this point, Chinese coolie labor is being brought in by uh, big business, uh, uh, particularly to build the railroads. Uh, and uh, from it comes out a leader, but from among the ranks of the working class, named Dennis Kearney. Uh, Kearney would give these fiery speeches uh, in and around San Francisco, filled, uh, you can imagine, with, with blanks to be filled in uh, and, 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 and absolutes. And frequently, at the end of the speech, a group would break off from the crowds that were listening to him, and they'd head over to Chinatown. And uh, as the illustration from the magazine shows, although it wasn't as quite <laughs> neat and clean and straight standing as that man, uh, they would just beat the hell out of Chinese. They would burn their homes, smash the windows of their stores, and so forth. When you get to 1882, this is where the politicians came in in this particular panic and sort of glommed off, off of it. And they, in 1882, they passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. This was the first time that the federal government had, had closed immigration off to a group of people solely because of their ethnicity. So here you have the federal government participating in panic. My definition of panic, I mean, I talk a lot about these elements. I refer to these elements as panic-inducing. Just because you use an absolute doesn't mean you're panicked. But then when are you panicked? I don't know that there's a bright, shiny line. But where I do think it is clear that you have panic is when someone or some group of people say or do that which they fear. In the, in the Salem witch hunt, one of the first things that happened, these three girls were having these inexplicable fits and they were deemed to be possessed by the devil. And a woman in the town had actually a, had a slave woman prepare uh, something called a witch's cake, which is a cake that's made from urine from the possessed person and fed to a dog. And it's believed that via the dog, the possessed person will spit out the name of the, of the witch that possessed her. The point is, she did that which she feared. Fearing that witchcraft was afoot in Salem, Massachusetts, she sought to combat it by engaging in witchcraft or in sorcery. Uh, uh, fearing that the Chinese were a danger to the United States, we weakened a founding document of this country by saying all men or people are created equal 
if they're not Chinese. Uh, and again and again, you'll see, you know, I, I think that's the realm of panic, where, where, where uh, people want to replace the First Amendment with the Bible or something uh, of, of that sort. Uh, kind of moving it now toward the final phase of what I wanted to talk about is, so and in fact, what I'm just saying, at what point then does it become panic? Uh, again, a big national success after World War II. It's hard to talk about that as a success. But after World War II, we, for the first time in our history, were the preeminent military and economic power in the world. And in 1949, that extraordinary achievement, part of it was that the rest of the world was flat on its back, but nevertheless, we had it. And in 1949, the Soviet Union detonated an atomic bomb. That was our big weapon. And the Red Scare kicked in in a way that made the previous Red Scare from the 1870s to the Palmer Raids in the 20s look like a tea party. Uh, uh, there was, they discovered, at Los Alamos Labs, where the bombs were developed, uh, a spy named Klaus Fuchs. He was a German uh, 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 native immigrant, and he was spying for the Soviet Union. And that is not panic to say, this guy was a spy. We need to, to deal with him. There was a whole spy ring that they dealt with there. We don't have time to go into it. But as you look into those stories, it's a little more gray about, so is it panic to send Ethel Rosenberg to the gas chamber for typing things her husband may have given her? What point is panic? So there isn't a bright, shining line. But I can tell you that the bomb was 1949. And in 1950, this book was published called Red Channels, and this is panic. Red Channels was a book that listed, I'm not good on the numbers, I think it was 150 or 115 uh, people in mass media, uh, film and television, uh, uh, or entertainment, who it said were either communists or uh, uh, suspected communist uh, uh, sympathizers. Uh, the list included, I don't know, with me, so I'll, go, I'll just go from memory here. Leonard Bernstein, the conductor Leonard Bernstein, uh, Aaron Copeland, who uh, composer of, of Appalachian Spring, uh, Yip Harburg, uh, uh, a lyricist who wrote the lyrics for the songs in The Wizard of Oz, uh, Orson Welles uh, uh, was on the list, uh, 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 Howard K. Smith, my favorite, if any of you are old enough to remember, uh, a newsman from ABC, Howard K. Smith, the thought of Howard K. Smith uh, as a communist, it just, uh, makes me grin. Uh, what this was is what we call guilt by association, probably a phrase you've heard. But I want to talk about the dynamic of guilt by association. Where does that dynamic, how, do, how does that work in the brain that that's so successful? And it's because it works on what really looks like a, a solid syllogism in some respects, though it really isn't. And uh, 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 philosophers have a fun way of demonstrating guilt by association, which is syllogism such as this. All cats have ears. Some of you may know this one. Socrates has ears. I think you see it coming. Therefore, Socrates is a cat. That because, you know, this is a communist group, and because they were one of the co-sponsors of this event, and because, uh, 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 you know, Leonard Bernstein came up and led the national anthem or something with, you know, therefore Leonard Bernstein is, is suspected communist. This was not invented in the 1950s. I'll give a quick example of it from, the 18, from 1870, which is when Americans were really kind of first learning what, what, this, what this thing communism is, this Karl Marx and, and all this stuff. And uh, France actually was, was undergoing a lot of political upheaval and commune and so forth. And in the Chicago Tribune, they published a lengthy article and if you can uh, read it, the, well, I boxed it up at the top. This section of the article says, uh, uh, what are the Reds, to inform their readers. And they actually give a, a pretty good brief description of the essence of, 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 of communism. Uh, the part I underline says, redistributing property and taking all labor under the direct protection of the state. OK. And then they go on one sentence after that to say, it is the grand collective ignorance of the Chicago Working Man's Congress. Well, I don't know. What is the Chicago, where we go, it's at? So when I read that, I thought, well, let's see what the Chicago Working Man's Congress was. Maybe it's like this radical thing. Turns out it was a group of, of, of blue-collar workers, if you will, that met in uh, Cincinnati. 
And they tried to plan ways to get other working men to vote for candidates that supported bills of interest to working people. And the bill that was most of interest back then was the eight-hour workday. So here was their syllogism, their version of Socrates as a cat. Collective action is central to communism. The Cincinnati Working Men's Congress urges collective action. Therefore, the Cincinnati Working Men's Congress is communist. Uh, this still goes on. In 2012, uh, 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 Michelle Bachman accused this woman, Huma Abedin. I'll just read from a letter she wrote to a fellow member of Congress. The mother, brother, and deceased father of Huma Abedin, Deputy Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, are connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, and that she, by extension, may be working as, uh, on the organization's behalf. Still trying, but it's the same, it's the same uh, 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 syllogism. Last element I want to talk about is statistics. And the reason I save it for last is because, boy, does it really, I think, show how wired in this stuff is to the way all of us think and why all of us, myself, are susceptible to panic-inducing thoughts. We don't necessarily all get freaked, but, but to those kind of thoughts. Uh, uh, there was this, this, of course, there have been a lot of studies like this, but this, this one goes back to 1896. This is a, a, a genuine scholar of the time, or academic at the time, and he did a correlational study where he took things like life expectancy, disease, uh, uh, crime, uh, alcoholism, various social things, and he correlated them to the different races. Uh, needless to say, black people correlated pretty high on that list. And his conclusion was, it is not in the conditions of life but in race and heredity that we find the explanation of the fact to be observed, here comes an absolute, in all parts of the globe, not enough, we'll go to another absolute, in all times, and another absolute, among all races, namely, the superiority of one race over another and of the Aryan race overall. Uh, what's faulty with that is something that, I don't know if you've ever taken statistics courses, but I, I, I when I took it, they taught it, I would imagine it would be in almost any statistics course, is correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things are correlated doesn't mean that one has caused the other. And when I took statistics, I remember the professor pointing out a study that was just astounding that showed that 99% of all murderers drank milk as children. <laughs> uh, but, it, but nevertheless, it is, it is something that's still used today and, and is very potent. Let me just give a quick example of, of a modern use of this, a little more subtly spun. This is a 1985 report from the Heritage Foundation, which refers to the radical feminist agenda. By the way, there is a blank to be filled in you hear a lot. The feminist agenda, the homosexual agenda, the Jewish agenda, fill in the blank with what you want. The blank is, you decide what the agenda is. They're not telling you what the agenda is, so your fears and needs will go into that. Uh, uh, there's another uh, blank to be filled in down at the bottom, destructive sex ideology. I'm not even <laughs> sure how to fill that in. I think it might mean gay, but I'm not sure. Uh, and there's an absolute up there with the word relentlessly, but here's the part about correlation causation. Students have been subjected to the feminist worldview through illustrations of women mining engineers, for example, and men happily tending the baby, wearing an apron, and stirring a pot during the day. So what this is saying, though it's not providing any data, because none exists, that when young children are exposed to these kind of images, it will destroy their sex ideology. Now, of course, you'd have to have a test where you also had young children who were shielded from any such images to see if there is even a correlation. Heritage Foundation doesn't mess with that. But they're implying that, take our word for it, that there is a correlation, and even if there were, this correlation does not imply causation, which I have right here. But here's the thing. It does not imply causation, but it does cause assumption. The way we, we operate, we, we don't call it correlations. We call it experiences and things we've read or seen is, is through assumptions. It's a vital element of everyone's behavior. If we did not make assumptions based on I'm going to say first correlations, and then I'll say based on our experiences, 
We would walk down the sidewalk the same way we cross a creek on wet rocks. But we have seen that sidewalk, and walked down it so many times, we make an assumption that it's okay to walk down that sidewalk. It is a very, very profound part of all, not just human behavior, but we'll just say all human behavior. So what is the uh, relationship between assumption and these things I've been talking about, correlation, causation, guilt by association, blanks to be filled in, filtered facts, absolutes, and the relationship is certitude. And certitude is something which all of us need. Uh, again, it's the walking down the sidewalk versus walking on the creek on wet rocks. The thing is, we don't all need it to the same degree. A quick example of that would be jealousy. Uh, uh, the need for certitude in a relationship. Some people need a lot more certitude than others and more prone to jealousy than others. The reasons are, are, are I, I couldn't begin to tell you, they may be different for every individual, just as with the need for certitude in, in these political kind of contexts. But the bottom line is this, this, this higher need for certitude. So at this point, I've kind of come to the learning curve that, that I went through in, in reading and studying to write this book, researching this book. I began with this question, why do political panics happen? And what I came to kind of realize is to really get a grasp on it. Yes, it's all those things we talked about, national hardship or manipulation of politicians or this or that, but the real essence is to come at the question backwards, come at it from the other direction and say, why do some people panic uh, when others don't? Uh, and, I think, and, and, and I think that in these elements I'm talking about, you'll see that all of them, absolutes, correlation, causation, fill in the blanks, uh, uh, they, they, they all feed certitude for those people who need a great deal of, uh, of certitude. I think that's why political panics happen when those conditions are right for people to need that certitude. And political panics are certainly unpleasant. I haven't emphasized here, but they are also extremely dangerous. And people die. People have died in great numbers because there are people in this country who have, who have been panicked. So if anything, this book can maybe do to get people to kind of just be more aware of those elements, boy, I will feel like I have, I have succeeded. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Are you alarmed at all about um, the ability for people to think anymore? Because as you, you're presenting these, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, I really have to read carefully to see that in there is so subtle, mm -hmm. it sucks you right in, and I find less and less, I mean, I, I'm in a position where I hire young people, that so many people are, um, to use a phrase, um, no, that they're uh, amusing themselves to death. Neil Postman, I think, said that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, they're so connected to media and being entertained that um, this whole inability to actually see these, this brainwashing that's going on, and also to know the difference when it is brainwashed and when it's actually factual. <clears throat> Yeah, well, sometimes it's very hard to know because the information isn't there, uh, particularly if the government or some group is, is withholding it. Um, I don't know if I'm concerned or not. I, I, you know, uh, I, I, I taught, uh, I've, I've done kind of adjunct teaching at universities, and I remember going to a meeting when I was teaching at an American university in the English department about should we be correcting, at first I thought this was an astonishing, stupid question, should we be correcting grammar and spelling on college papers? There actually was an argument, I won't go through it because that has nothing to do with what I, the point I'm trying to make, but there actually was an argument for maybe not always doing that. But the guy who ran the meeting began by passing out a sheet of paper that had four quotes about how the level of writing among freshmen has just deteriorated awful. It's just, and one of them was from, you know, recent, you, I think you see where I'm going. The other was from like the 1950s one was from the turn of the century and one was from the 19th century. Um, it's sometimes hard to get a perspective on, on 
because the, the, the means of what you call entertaining themselves, of this kind of inward thing uh, changed. Is it, is it really a change or not? It's sometimes hard to know. Um, this stuff was, it's, it, believe me, no one in the 19th century was any more attuned to this than readers today. That's why they were using them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right now, you're at a better risk walking down Third Street home than you are of a terrorist. Much mm -hmm. bigger risk. Right. Hugely bigger. Yeah. But yet, you understand? Yes, I have to do. There's a, a and, and a, a, I have a bugaboo myself, which you, right. you, I have a bugaboo myself. Did, by the way, did everyone hear the man's comment? Um, that that uh, uh, they don't have some kind of a high school course that is sort of just sort of elementary statistics uh, 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 to, just, to just kind of know things like that. What are the odds of, you know, even a question such as, uh, uh, I was in Seattle the other day, you know who I ran into? What are the odds of that? Well, it depends how you set up the question. I mean, it's, it's fascinating stuff, but it's also important. There was a book written years ago, and I'm embarrassed because I don't remember the guy who wrote it, but it should be required reading in public school. It's called, the, the title itself will tell you why I'm saying this. A Mathematician Reads the Newspaper. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. I thought you could say I wrote that book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think that's a, a, just a brilliant, accessible book that uh, would, I, wish, I wish everybody had to read when they go through school, yeah. It's an interesting question. He asked if there were, I felt there were certain forms of media that were more effective at spreading panic. Yeah, I would have to say, uh, Certainly, uh, visual media, I think, have more going for them uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, the book. I, I spent quite a bit of time talking about Birth of a Nation, 1925, which it, it just did so much to ignite panic over African Americans in a way that even, even in the, after Reconstruction ended and Jim Crow got put into place, it just, it just got so, uh, and, 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 and part of it was just the sheer numbers of people that it reaches, that the messenger reaches. Uh, there's a book called The Tipping Point that kind of speaks to the, how, the stickiness of a message and the importance of the messenger. And I, I think that's, that uh, 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 that book really kind of addresses what's underlying that, that question, yeah. Yes, sir. I guess I'd like to say two things. Uh, the title American Panic sort of suggests uh, it, it, it's too much limited to us when in fact it's a worldwide phenomenon, of course. And, I, and you made that point, but your title sort of steers one away from that. Um, and the second point is today we have the capacity to be in our own bubble. We can read whatever media we want, and I think that greatly exacerbates this Phenomenon that yeah, yeah. I was reading the other day about the right wing of the Supreme Court, the, the five, mm -hmm. and what it is they read, what newspapers they read. Scalia, for example, reads the Washington Times and never reads the Washington Post or the New York Times. <laughs> That's and interesting. Magazines that have a similar yeah, yeah. far right yeah. orientation. Yeah. He's in a bubble. Yeah. The bubble is not new. Uh, as for the title, uh, uh, the book doesn't, you're absolutely right, but the book doesn't try to get, it's too big to do panics throughout the world, at least for me. Uh, so uh, it, it, it tries to explain that this is just dealing with the ones here. It doesn't mean to exclude that they happen elsewhere. Uh, but, but, the, but the point about the bubble, you know, our general generation, particularly those of us who are kind of in our 50s and 60s and so forth, even 70s, uh, I, I think are, 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 are uh, journalistically spoiled from what, I mean, I'm talking about something I don't know a whole lot about, so I'm gonna be a little hesitant, but I'll call it the, the, the Edward R. Murrow era of journalism. Uh, and the early era, uh, which he brought to television, of, of television journalism. For most of journalism's history, and again, I'm talking America, but it's not it's true in other countries, newspapers were not these sort of objective or even trying to aspire to be these objective things. They were usually the wings of political parties or political views and uh, 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 the bubble existed very much even then if, if, if all you read was 
the New York Herald. My wife works in newspapers and periodicals, the Library of Congress. Uh, and I remember saying to her, when I was doing this research, I said, Yo, the New York Herald, I, I don't understand. They're like so pro-South prior to the Civil War. And she said, well, it's the New York Herald. And had to explain to me that New York and the cotton trade and Wall Street were connected, and this was the paper that was the New York interest and the cotton. Newspapers were so biased. They're kind of getting back to their, to their good old time tradition of, of being, being those bubbles. Yeah. What about an isolated incident such as the radio broadcast of War of the Worlds, which touched off a brief but intense panic that we were being invaded by those radio listeners who were not tuned into the introduction where they said this is a, a, a fictional adaptation? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, what's going through my head is that when I first started on this project, uh, among the people I talked to was a cousin of mine who's a uh, psychology professor. And as, just for any guidance, and one of the things he pointed me to, and he said, look at journals on, article, journal articles on rumor. And I kind of did, but I wasn't finding quite what I wanted, and I have a, again, don't know how long, I'm gonna take a guess that what you're describing probably is more connected to what scholars have unearthed about rumor. Uh, and rumor is a piece of this, you know, but uh, I, I suspect it's a little different, uh, uh, the, 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 those, kind of, uh, those kind of panics. I talk a lot in the book about unverified claims uh, and uh, how do you verify. Uh, uh, in the uh, Red Scare, there were these tapes that, uh, microfilms, that uh, 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 condemned, uh, legally, were kind of the thing that condemned uh, Alger Hiss uh, for uh, having a relationship, a spying relationship with uh, uh, Whitaker Chambers. But of course, they wouldn't show us the microfilms because national security. Well, how do you verify? How do we know they're not blank? Actually, one of them was. Um, uh, the other gets a little more semi-verifiable, a little hard to know again, but. Uh, 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 when you're not told, and a lot of times, and in the book I'm, I talk about this in a lot of modern things with, well, the NSA, they will not tell us. You can kind of understand why they might not tell us, but the very act of not verifying something, or keep it, that becomes this powerful block, black, block, blank, thank you, to be filled in. Um, so his question was, is there anything that has diffused or dispersed the panic? I have a better answer in a second, but I'll start on the Chinese, was, was uh, as Japan rose as a power, in Asia, and we came to be more concerned about Japanese aggression, military aggression as a foreign policy, panic over Chinese Americans uh, started to decrease. In fact, there were all these articles that would say, uh, you know, the, Jap the Japanese Americans who were coming there, they're, 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 they're filthy, even the Chinese don't like them. Well, wait a minute, if you'd read the articles about the Chinese, you know, how can, how can that anything be worse than these, plague of frogs, they were once called. Uh, uh, and what ended it altogether, the kaboom, fear of Chinese, was December 7, 1941. Uh, and in a certain way, by extension, and, and this is really what I should have answered with first, what has been a real recurring element in diffusing panic is when we have gone to war, including the Civil War, and you are dying with members of that group that group that was, you had been panicked about, are dying alongside you. That oftentimes has really diffused the panic. One group it didn't diffuse it for were black people because they put them in segregated groups. So they weren't dying next to you. They were dying for their country, but out of, out of sight. But the panic over Catholics, uh, their, their, their uh, participation in, in all the wars, and uh, the final nail in that coffin, I think, when John Kennedy ran for office, uh, uh, was that Catholics, for better or for worse, were among the leading anti-communist voices in this country. Joe McCarthy and people like that. There's a flip side. Hey, they were Catholics, so you can no longer kind of fear Catholics in quite the same, in quite the same way. Yes? I found it Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation since we have freedom of religion. And I still hear that. Like, can you imagine a Muslim, you know, like with a turban running for president? You know, a brilliant person? Do you think they'd ever get into office? I think we still have that great scare. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know how that's ever going to get into office. Uh, 
probably over time the way the others do, they, they, they fade. Uh, uh, of course, he's not a Muslim, so that's really not going to contribute to it. Uh, but there is a whole chapter in the, in the book on, on, I call it Muslim slash Arabs, because not all Arabs are Muslims and not all, I don't know, and so forth. But uh, it, it, yeah, very much. Was there a question over here? Yes, sir. Yeah, Prior yeah. to World War II, yeah. during World War II, they became an ally. So Interesting. They became white folks. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I grew up as a white folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, it reminded me of two quick things I'll, I'll mention in that regard. When Oklahoma became a state, Oklahoma had been the Indian territory. There are a lot of Indians in Oklahoma. Uh, uh, the first law that they passed was to segregate their... Uh, uh, rail stations and their rail cars, uh, but in order to do that, the Constitution def of Oklahoma defined an Indian as a white person. Uh, the one of the other example that comes to mind is when we, uh, when Puerto Rico became a territory of the United States after the Spanish-American War, uh, there was an incident where they wouldn't let a, a group of Puerto Ricans were going to be uh, migrant workers, actually up here in the Northwest. Uh, but they wouldn't let them, when the boat docked in New Orleans, they wouldn't let them off for fear that they wouldn't get back on, because now they're Americans. Uh, but there was some question, well, they're Americans, but are they citizens? Can they vote? Chicago said no, they wouldn't let Puerto Ricans vote. This is all early part of the 20th century. Do you know when Puerto Ricans were, were given citizenship and the right to vote? In 1917, when we went into World War II, World War I, it was like, you're citizens, here are your draft papers. Uh, yeah, 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 so it's... Uh, Oftentimes, it's, it's also interesting that the Chinese Exclusion Act, 1882, yeah. was finally descended in what year? Oh, it was, was, it was during the war, 43, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and Chinese were allowed to immigrate into the United States, right. and they were given this magnificent, large quota of 105 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know about the quote. I do write in the book about their lifting it, but I didn't know the quote was 102. Wow. So uh, it's, it's, it's endlessly fascinating stuff, I find, and, but, but, but difficult, painful, but important.